is because, see, if this is a standard term uh, at the LBDI, it's dealing with so much administrative uh, financial issues. So we ask, even though we confirm, he, he, he asks to be excused. And well, it is a good thing for us because right now we are generally over, overwhelmed. Madam, your power, follow your, your, your career pathway, you've been doing so well. You work at, uh, is this my turn? Yeah, you, you, you've been doing so well, your, your career growth has been so amazing. And we'd like to keep the ball rolling from your perspective. Um, achieving a sustainable inclusive recovery from COVID in Liberia requires a lot from your institution perspective, from your personal perspective, we would like to hear from you. Thank you. I can use this, thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for that introduction and for all of the organizers for such an important event. So um, to that question in the, in the conversational discussion of five minutes, I'd like to begin by sharing an experience during the COVID period of being locked down in Nigeria. A medical library is a human rights organization. We do work on gender equality and youth empowerment, and we feel the social and gender based violence. And during the lockdown, some of the cases we receive or complaints are from women who, pregnant women, who are trying to access healthcare services and were prevented by the lockdown. And that is a representation of how the many laws and policies that we have, including the laws of our environment, when it comes to applying the really late realities of the week, when we have crisis, including climate disasters, the reality is different. So we have the policies and everything, but when we have crisis, we have emergency, we have conflict, we always have the absence of really, really having a substantive a push to addressing gender issues, and that is problematic. So as we gather here today to reflect on the state of the environment since the Stockholm Conference in 1972, it is worth and highly commendable that progress has been made to protect and preserve our environment. And while the high quality and youth empowerment may not have been a highlight of the discussion in 1972, the date of the conference uh, has created a platform for activists, academics, governments, to elevate the issue of general quality in the environment, or national general environment. And we can see, for example, people with our with like work obligations on the United Nations Human Convention, we can see the government develop our first um, climate change general action plan. So these are programs that we say are commendable, even when in reality, um, there's so much, so much more to be desired. So, the intersections of the environment, poverty and development is a gender issue. Hence, the first step to achieve a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the coronavirus pandemic is recognizing gender and the different impacts of the pandemic on men, women, boys, and girls as crucial for social economic recovery and ensuring that recovery plans address the gender intersecting impacts. So the human like real coronavirus, social economic response and recovery plan, community will provide for looking to the health impact of the pandemic to work on more realistic approach by increasing the economic impact of the pandemic. And in fact, it means that pre and post pandemic, there is still an issue of women's under representation in environment decision between institutions. There are general differences in environment related adaptation and mitigation strategies in order to take a holistic approach to mainstreaming gender, which does not challenge the structures that continue to reinforce gender inequality across all sectors in the environment. So, in order to achieve a sustainable and inclusive recovery from coronavirus disease in the context of environment and its linkages to social economic growth, I would say for policy improvements must avoid political finding the role of women in the environment and all providing programs and sustainable resources or capacity to succeed. 
the modernity development cultural civil society will not be addressing building the expertise around general requirements. We just see the advice they say, put your money where your mouth is. We need expertise in the country, we need at the eating at the mission of gender, we need also experts who can also support the government in order to help us to monitor the outcomes and obligations that we are signing into. So we need to go beyond just having gender desk and putting people to behind those desks, but giving them the support and the capacity to be able to support our national um, obligations. We show all the women's rights to cover things across all the development sectors adequately in the gender, and we see the government and development partners are doing this and we need to see more. Address the situation of violence against women. By health we being fought by coronavirus disease, including the linkages between SGBV and violence and climate change. So many when we talk about environment, we think about all of the other things. A lot of things, for instance, I was hoping to do some work with UNDP and went to do consultations in the counties. One of the things we learned that was really very senior and it is heavy as a result of Change. But some communities are cut off from a lot of services. And the general authorities of this country told us that they receive a lot of cases of sexual and gender based violence. But they are incapacitated to respond to those cases because of the movement, because of the heavy rains. But how often do we think about those kind of issues and think climate change and think the impacts of the environment on health and well being? So we need to be very intentional when we say gender. We go beyond that sort of process of just counting women and ensuring that policies and programs go beyond what we are expected to think. We need to increase women representation in environment decision making institutions, ensure that environment adaptation and mitigation adequately meets to gender differences, and invest in research and general analysis. Because it is imperative to understand the consequences of environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity, climate change, and all of that, on women, men, boys, and girls. So we hope that as we go to the next meeting in June, we will have these consultations. We are also encouraged to like to re echo our chairperson for the Civil Society Council. We will have a consultation on involved women, women, or gender, or women, led institutions across all sectors. Let's hear when we talk water, the soil, all of these things. How is it impacting the lives of women? What are the lessons we can learn? And what can we take to this meeting in June? To so welcome you, we really appreciate being here. But I think there's a lot more we can hear from communities and women across all sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. We have to extend the dialogue. Federation and our being here. From your perspective, uh, addressing uh, an inclusive recovery for Liberia when it comes to COVID-19, what are your perspectives and how the youth can play a meaningful role? Thank you. First of all, good morning, everyone. Let me just begin by expressing my gratitude to the city sponsor. Uh, by accepting the embassy in Liberia, the UNDP, as well as the EPA climate for such a world convention. So I want to have the young people of Liberia to have talk and engagement is to, is to help us have a moment to reflect. They are not happy about the composition. They realize that the world will not be much room in the next five to ten years from now. The conversation today is a part of the responsibility. And so we have come to key points. One, we have talked and haven't had a time to explain the COVID at its peak in the world in Liberia at the time. I think where we are as a country, if we need to not just our words but our actions, I believe the first thing to look at is that all of our political commitments, how do we align political commitments with the SDG? We need to build our political commitments 
to achieve a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So, I want to highlight a few recommendations as we go into uh, questions and answer later on. So, I want us to look at one, the first area, support access to finance through data saving loan and association diversification. Why I say so? A high priority target should be supporting the resuscitation of small businesses with a focus on boosting the financial activities of existing alternative financial structures, the Vita Saving Loan Association, a facility being utilized by informal business actors across Liberia. The Vita Saving Loan Association is an innovative facility for trained to be a disruptor which may have contributed to our liquidity crisis especially during the heat of the pandemic. Even now, billions of Liberian dollars are being saved outside of the former banking sector across Liberia because the data saving loan association groups are afraid of the system, the former banks. And when I saw that I was on the panel with uh, Jim Derry, I was happy because I knew he was going to address this issue. But however, the message will resonate. So the VSLA institution need to converge from the formal banking system to the formal banking system. And this will increase the VSLA groups, access to financial products, such as bank deposits, large loans, and security for their savings. Why this is sustainable banks should be open to flexible arrangements that break back with traditional banking system. The second area, I want us to also look at investment into agriculture. High priority targets should also be direct investment in the informal agriculture sector of rural Liberia where about 70% of the population, especially women, supporting farmers to produce and consume what they grow and to sell and reinvest in the soil to expand the production capacity is crucial. And I also want us to prioritize customary land formalization processes. Invest in small businesses of at risk groups. Direct investment in a commercial motorcycle transportation sector, as well as similar areas where at risk and hard to reach youths are located, will reduce despite social tensions and help a critical sector achieve recovery. And for Enhance the health sector's capabilities to respond to future pandemic. Building the capacity of the sector to respond to any future pandemic or an epidemic such as measles, the measure of health is currently combating. This is very key. Update COVID-19 vaccination campaign. The measure of health successfully led the response against COVID-19, which has succeeded, but final success depends on a successful rollout of the vaccination phase. Increase awareness of the vaccination process to reduce the myth around the vaccination. Cocktail corruption in the health sector, a high priority issue has always been ensuring the routine operation of health facilities and services, including drugs. Sadly, it is reported that essential health commodities are diverted to the private clinics and pharmacies of health workers 
who are reportedly prescribed drugs and sent poor patients to buy from their facilities. If this cycle of corruption is not broken, all investments in the health sector will only make poor sick patients poorer and will put at risk, high risk the lives of those who cannot afford. To conclude, everything seems to be a priority in Liberia because of the massive need we have, we have for achieving a sustainable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic in the economy and health sector should be a high priority target for us all. Thank you so much. From a human being's perspective, you've heard from Loretta, you've heard from Mr. Williams, you've heard from Black. These are strong issues that are, that will help us to potentially expand our response to COVID, which have a ripple effect. From the UN system perspective, how is your institution supporting Liberia and these local organizations to ensure that we, you know, we, we balance that as well? Please put your hands together for him. since I came to Liberia. But just to say today, um, the panel, the distinguished panel that have been uh, speaking here, including my fellow women, I have to say that Liberia has got a wealth of very, very um, able and um, powerful um, bodies to move some of the agendas through. Just listening at the conversation that was going on uh, from them, really one wonders um, why we cannot be where we want to be at as a country. Um, but I really uh, want to say that um, um, this has been really um, very um, an interesting conversation. But also realizing, and I was just seeing in the audience, I'm seeing a lot of young people. For me, that's the way to go. If you're talking about sustainable and inclusive recovery, for any particular issue, including COVID, including humanitarian, including, um, I would say, leadership, you mentioned them all. The youth have to be at the forefront. And when I talk about the youth, I want to talk about the young women. We have a lot of young women with a lot of potential to move some of these issues forward. But are they in the spaces that we want them to be? Are they part of the decisions that are being made? I'm sure during COVID-19, just like the rest of the world, everything became at a standstill. Our health system was overstretched. Our health workers were overstretched. Relationships in their homes were constrained because of the fact that people had to be staying in indoors. Um, all of this had a huge impact on our young women, huge impact on our economy, huge impact on our health systems. When we look at um, all these issues, we had also some negative things that came out of them. I mentioned some, and I'm sure this is also the case for Liberia. I would say issues around violence increased because we had people sitting in the houses under lockdown 
the single anywhere, they could already participate in the informal economy. What happens? Sometimes you would find that disagreements will emerge and no violence will, you know, was emerging in the homes. Secondly, children, because of the lockdown, were also not going to school. What was the impact of this? It means that some of the children then, because of just sitting idle at home, it meant that some of them were participating in other activities that were, that were not good for them. As a result, some girls maybe felt pregnant, and that may be a surge of teenage pregnancies in the country, I am sure. Then again, I look at um, all the um, issues around health workers. Uh, we know that most of the time when we talk about health workers, particularly in Africa, and I'm sure that the same, most of them are women. And then when it comes to even caregiving, it's women. But my issue is where were the women when we did a task force that was trying to address the issues around COVID? Were they on the table to make the decisions? People will find out that these were not in the, on the table. So um, for me, I think in terms of how do we sustain the inclusive recovery from coronavirus and any other humanitarian um, in action issues, I think first of all, we need to look at addressing these root um, endemic issues that emerge, particularly affecting and impacting on women more. I mentioned gender-based violence as one of the issues. This needs to be mitigated and reduced. The house, I think the, 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 the people in this room can come up with very strong and very strategic interventions that could be very helpful. Secondly, I look at social uh, protection and economic stimulus packages that will serve um, women and girls. My women colleagues that have been sitting here, they mentioned about the loss of the economy for the women, right? Meaning that most of the women are involved in um, the formal economy markets. What is it that we can put in place to ensure that recovery takes into account our women and girls? during any humanitarian action. Then again, the issues around care work, I mentioned it. I think it's about time men do take roles in also supporting care work. Because I think we live together as one, and together when there are issues to do with um, care, let us go together as a team. But also on women and girls leading and they also need to lead and participate in response and planning and decision making. They have to be on the table. Nothing for us, nothing against us, I mean nothing for us, against us. So they need to be on the table. We cannot just talk about women when we don't involve and they're not on the table. Then also we need to coordinate later as um, as, as, as colleagues and as a country. We are talking about all these issues, but if we do not coordinate and ensure that gender perspectives are addressed, then I think we are, we are losing it. So as we are moving forward, I would say that um, we need to be looking at these things and uh, be able to work as a, as a team. But lastly, I just want to say that um, as UN women, um, which is also part of the UN um, entities in this country, we will be continue to provide uh, technical and um, support the government, as well as its partners in Liberia, to ensure that um, any of the national responses towards um, the issues that we're talking about today, um, we have strategies that meet and also address women needs. A joint responsive um, implementation of a national and global recovery strategy is important to achieving results and depict a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, I want to assure you 
that the UN and the women remains committed to working with key stakeholders, partners on ensuring that a gender responsive policy environment that promotes healthy climate for women and girls, including men and boys alike, demonstrating a healthy planet for everyone. I wish to stop here and I want to thank everyone uh, for this discussion and looking forward to more conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Nkwaba. We emphasize the need for youth inclusion, um, the need for women to be included in spaces of decision making. We emphasize um, um, the, the need for us to reduce sexual gender based violence, um, address the issues of child children development. Uh, especially in the context of teenage pregnancy as a result of, of COVID, but you also spoke along the lines of economic stimulus for women and for especially women in the local subnational areas. Um, you, you spoke about the need for us to exchange rules or be part of the team for caregiving. When I say us, gentlemen, I'm talking about us. Uh, and finally, we spoke of the need for coordination in especially gender integration initiatives and that the UN Women is always available to support government as it, as, as it aligns its priorities to address these challenges. That being said, Minister Dovo Sao and I will go way back, he's a good friend of mine, smart, one of the erudite ones coming up. Uh, in government public service, so we want to hear from you. The POPD is one of the most elaborate developmental agenda that we've had uh, in Liberia's history. Um, but COVID has set us back a little bit. And as country, from your perspective at the Ministry of Finance and Development, how are we responding as part of our recovery plan to COVID-19 impacts. Thank you very much. I say that the very back to the words that I have. And then it's a little bit of a point. Well, I first I want to appreciate uh, the young people and the EPM for the last few days uh, event. Um, we've had very good partnership with um, the UN between uh, the cities of the other bilateral, multilateral partners that are working with the government of Liberia to ensure that the aspirations of our people are not going to make sure they can come As we indicated, the COVID 19 uh, is pandemic in several de decades that the world experienced. We've always had a pandemic regional, but this one was in a global. So, as a result, you observe the global economy was affected seriously. You know, uh, production reduced heavily. Uh, the economy contracted by like 10%. But to so to have a new rebound, the government had to take a lot of decisions. So those kinds of decisions were meant to actually uh, affect our citizens, both environmentally, social economically, as well as you know, uh, to try to bring back to school where our economy was prior to the COVID, so the government had to put in place policies that would make sure that we would leave our PPP. So one of the initial was to look at now help being global and begin to see that our internal fundamental of the economy of uh, uh, modern economy of fundamental were actually disrupted. Uh, we observed that inflation was increasing, 
Um, there are many vaccines that we are aware of. We know about the, the AstraZeneca, which uh, Michelle Health says is two doses. We heard about the Pfizer, one dose. We also heard about the Johnson & Johnson, one dose. But even um, how do I know the difference between uh, the vaccine, what one is preferable for me to take, or how should I take it, or who should take what, these are the information I'm missing. And because of those missing information, it has created myths around the vaccination. And I tell you, um, it is mandatory right now to have a vaccination card when you are traveling, even right here to Accra. If you don't have a vaccination card, you will be able to travel. So Ministry of Health has to do well with the information sharing. And because of that, we just did a project to one of our partners, OSIWA. OSIWA is going to support the National Civil Society Council of Liberia to decentralize the information around vaccine, and we'll work closely with the Ministry of Health and the National Public, uh, uh, the National Public Health Institute of Liberia to, to create the awareness and to encourage more people to get vaccinated. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just in. I think in my mind, part of the way to address that is to improve on partnership and respect for institutions. I think it will help to deal with how we struggle with the issue of the vaccine. Uh, the civil society space needs to be respected. The government needs to understand that the need for partnership is important and respect for the structure. To the question asked by my brother, uh, I think today we will opportune to be at the table. I think we need to utilize that space that we as young people now are at the table. We must engage the process, we engage in with an informed position. When we come to the conversation, we must be able to dialogue, we must be able to take away the sentiments and the activism to advocacy. In that way, I think we will be giving more opportunity. I'm glad that Sweden has stepped in through UNDP to ensure that young people participation in conversations like these is very important. And I'm glad that Professor Tapper, who is a former FLY executive, has given the youth an unhindered space at EPA. Let's utilize it in the way that we come to the conversation understanding that we have a responsibility to contribute to where we are today and the future we want to inherit. In that way, we will open the conversation for education, for participation, for dialogue, for national ownership. We are very close to owning what we intend to be, but we can only do that when we come to the conversation willing to participate, to dialogue, to understand and supporting the process. Thank you.